good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome aboard. As we already discussed, I am not Adam. I am Pete. Adam moved to a different room. Uh, and I'm excited to be here. We're going to talk about a culture of safety for grown-ups. How many of you were in the session yesterday, one of the sessions that Kristen and I led upstairs about trauma-invested practice? Okay, so just a couple of you. All right, so well, part of that conversation was about creating a culture of safety for kids and how do we do that. And it's kind of important for us to do that for grown-ups to be in a, in a place where they feel safe and secure and okay so that they can do the things that create a culture of safety for kids. So this is kind of the prerequisite session to some of the things Kristen's been talking about, I think, a little bit more today as well. Um, and I'm excited to be here to have this conversation with us. I want to share with you just a, a little bit about me for any of you who maybe don't know me. Uh, my name's Pete. I'm a former school principal. I was a teacher. I was assistant principal. I was principal for 12 years in three different schools in Reno and in Spokane. And then for the last couple of years, I've been out and about providing professional development to schools and districts all across the world. And I, I love it. I enjoy it quite a bit. We were just talking about, does, and you, they were asking if my wife loves it that I travel. And she says she doesn't, but I think she does. I think she's glad. That, I mean, it, doesn't, I, it, it is what it is. Um, so I'm excited to be here to be able to do this work with you. I want to share with you a, a photograph. This is uh, my most recent uh, school staff at uh, Shaw Middle School in Spokane, Washington, and I, we took them to do the ropes course. So we went and did one of those big team building things and bring everyone together. And as you notice, they've all got the similarly colored shirts. Across the top of the screen are the core values that that school, the staff and the student body and the parent groups all kind of came together to create and identify what are the things that matter the most to us. And we described them, defined them, we talked about them every month in our uh, big whole school assemblies and all that kind of stuff. And then we had t-shirts made that have those words across. So I don't know if you can see that they've got them. So um, I'm wearing the one that says unity, I think. And this guy's got grit and there's love and commitment. So it's just kind of a neat way to bring those cultural pieces to light. And so we gave all the kids shirts. So everybody has a shirt. So every, every once in a while we would say, hey, Wednesday's uh, core value shirt day. So everybody would wear their shirts. It's really cool to see that kind of unity across the, across the board. So when we talk about creating a culture of safety, one of those things is to clear, clearly identify what it is that's most important to us. Uh, so I share that with you because that's, I think that's fun. Here's our target. We have one target. We're going to read it together. Here we go, everybody, with your big afternoon voices on three. One, two, three. That's right. Those were very polite reading voices. You did very nicely on that. So we'll talk about some things that are intended to do that, to create this sense of safety. And I imagine each of you is here for a particular reason. You decided to come to this session because there's something you want to learn about, something you want to talk about, something you want to hear about, or you thought Adam was still in this room and maybe you just come and hear what Adam is and then you just don't want to get up and leave again. That's fine. Uh, and I'm interested in having those conversations with us. So I will present a little bit, I'll share some stuff, and I really want to get the conversation flowing between us as we get going. So I'm going to ask us to start with that um, by thinking about leadership and thinking about, in particular, a leader with whom you have worked, somebody you've worked for, somebody you have followed at some point. And I want you to think about the greatest leader. Now, if you're like me and you can't pinpoint one really great leader that you've had, then what I'd like you to do is to think about the multiple leaders you've had and identify what are the nuggets of wisdom or the greatness, some elements of greatness that they possessed and shared with you that maybe you're carrying on that tradition. What are some of those really fantastic components of leadership that you've learned along the way from actual role models, actual mentors? And when you're ready, lean over to the people sitting at the table with you and engage in some rich, robust dialogue about those people and those leadership lessons, just so we can surface some of those a little bit. So we have those flowing through our heads about these great elements of leadership. And if you need to move to talk to somebody, that's perfectly fine. If you want to have some self-reflection time, that's fine too. Gotta have the mic on, because everyone. All right, so talk to me a little bit. What are some of those key lessons that we've picked up from leaders along the way? Forward thinkers. Forward thinkers. So it's not just in the moment, reactive to whatever's crashing right now. It's planning in advance. OK? Ah, 
clear vision that is then communicated and eliciting support and commitment from others, stakeholders. Okay? Wonderful. Okay, so somebody who's oriented towards seeing strengths and empower people to actually use their strengths. Beautiful. Okay, so someone who b focuses on relationships with everybody in the or organization. Like, you can't tell your, uh, the quality of your performance based on the strength of the relationship you have with your administrator or that leader. It has equal relationships, powerful relationships with everybody. And that's a challenge. In the last session that I led, how many of you were in the last session? We talked about performance concerns, and it's hard to build strong relationships with people who have performance concerns. Because a lot of us, we have difficulty separating the performance concern from the person. So isolating that relationship can be really challenging. Excellent. OK, what else? Yes, ma'am. Empathy. What is it? How do you define empathy? So knowing the emotional reality that someone else is experiencing and being okay with that, acknowledging that, communicating that. Beautiful. Consistency. Okay, consistency. It's safe to go to them because they're not hot cold without being there to say Ah, so it's safe to go to somebody with a concern because you have a pretty good idea of how that person's going to respond to you and it doesn't their mood doesn't vary so much that you're like, is now a good time to talk to that person or should I wait till after second period? Right, so okay. So that consistency of that emotional presence, good. Others. Coachable? Coachable? Approachable. approachable. I might say both, coachable and approachable, right? So someone that you can go to and you feel like it's okay to go to somebody and ask for help or to request something, excellent, all right? So I want you to hang on to those. And the reason I asked you to hang on to those is because when we start to put together for ourselves that image and that vision of positive leadership, of somebody that really can impact a culture and a community and an environment, then we start to put together a little bit of an image of what we have to do to create that in our leadership roles. So hang on to those visions, hang on to those conversations. We'll continue to kind of circle. You won't be able to help but circle back to some of those as we go through our, our dialogue today. So as we think about leadership, we really want to get beyond the three Bs. Y'all know the three Bs, right? Budgets, buildings, and buses, right? A lot of us were kind of trained in leadership that you just need to make sure the place doesn't fall apart or burn to the ground. And as long as you're doing that, as long as the right people are in the right spots, then everybody's fine, we're good, and we could just make it through the day, make it through the semester, I make it through my career, and we're good. Well, we want to get beyond that to create an environment that actually has growth and progress and we have lifelong learners and we build a stronger community. That's really what we're trying to do. So that's more than this, right? So we're going to talk about this culture of safety, this idea of how we do that and, and what a culture of safety is. And I'm going to position this for those of you who are with me and Kristen yesterday. You've seen this graphic before and you know Maslow's hierarchy. Everyone's seen this before, yeah? So the whole idea here is, well, let me ask you this. Where do teachers... Teachers meeting high expectations, where does that fit in our graphic? Where's high performance instruction on that graphic? Where's kids meeting high standards and rigor? Where's all that? That's all up near the top, right? So we, we emphasize this idea of safety to remind us that all those things are valid and they're valuable and this is what we're striving for. And if we're not taking care of the human element, if we're not making sure that we're partnering and communicating and building that culture together first in which people are safe, we're never gonna get to that place. It just won't work out. So I love this hashtag Maslow before bloom. I heard the other day, we must Maslow before they bloom. I thought that was kind of a neat way to think of it. And we think about it with our adults just the same as we could with our kids, right? So these are the three components of a culture of safety. We have safety, predictability, and consistency. And I want you to think for a second about what does safety mean to you as a grown-up, as an adult, as a professional, whatever your role is. What are the things that contribute to you being and feeling safe when you go to work? And I'm going to ask Amy mm -hmm. yeah, if you would scribe for us. Oh. I know. 
because I couldn't help but look over your shoulder and see your amazing handwriting. And so, if you would, please, describe for us, what are the things that help us to feel safe or to be safe when we're at work? How would you define that? What are the, what are the characteristics? Okay, so clear expectation of how adults interact with each other. Feel free to summarize however you feel okay. you need to do it. So at a staff meeting, there's clear expectations. In the hallway, there's clear expectations. How do we talk to each other? How do we interact with each other? Good. Yeah, just write all that. What else? So clear expectations for adult behavior. Great. What else helps you to feel safe at work? Okay, so the expectation of respect. You're going to be treated respectfully as a professional as, as a human being in interactions. Okay? What else? Well, clear procedures for how things are done. Okay? Clear policies and procedures for how we do stuff around here. Yes, ma'am. Oh, so you feel supported. You feel supported. That's important. What are some others? Yes, sir. Okay, so that you have a connection with somebody in the building. And if you've ever, um, you ever looked up the Gallup organization? And do you know any work that Marcus Buckingham has done? He did a 10-question survey. One of the questions is, do I have a best friend at work? And it seems like kind of a funny question to ask about the, work, the safety of the workplace environment, but it really does speak to the fact of, do you have somebody that you can go and vent to? Do you have somebody that you can commiserate with and you can talk to that understands your plight and feels your pain, right? So that's a, that's a big part of it, okay? What are some others? Yeah, so there's that physical safety from the roof, the single point of entry, the locked perimeter fence, the security guard, whatever those things might be. And then there's that other element that you mentioned, which is we've got rules for orderly behavior in here. So as, if I'm going to walk down the hallway and if I'm going to walk in the cafeteria, I kind of know what I'm ex expecting to see. Okay, as opposed to, and we could play the antonym game, right? Chaos and mayhem. Right? It's not chaos and mayhem. There's order. There's structure. Okay. A couple things I'm surprised haven't come up yet. Okay, transparency and decision making. So there's no mystery place that things happen. Okay, so there's a process for how we share information and we're transparent and we're open about our decision making process. There is that transparency and leadership. Okay. Did trust come up yet? That we trust each other to do the, the work that we expect each other to be doing? Trust is kind of a tricky one, isn't it? Because it's really difficult to build trust, but it's really easy to violate it and to break it. And it's really, really hard to build it back again. So trust is another piece. I think that's a pretty good list for now. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate that. Oh, you wanted to I do. I wanted to fist bump, and I wanted to take the marker simultaneously. OK, so we got safety. A couple things that came up in the, in the course of that conversation are the next two elements of our culture of safety. We got predictability, where folks like to know what's coming up next. And so one of the first things that came up when I asked you to talk about those great leaders was forward thinking, right? How many of us have worked for folks in which it almost was as if the leader did not know we had a faculty meeting this morning? Right? It's like, I don't really know what we're going to talk about this morning in our faculty meeting, so we better put an agenda together real quick. Or, gosh, I'm glad I have an assistant principal that I can say, you need to build the agenda for the staff meeting. Yeah, I know it starts in seven minutes. Go. Right? Or did we know well in advance exactly what was, what was coming up, what we we're going to talk about, and then it's a continuation of conversations we've already had so that it's predictable. A lot of our folks need to know what that predictability. We talked about the vision and having a clear vision, how important that is. Without a clear vision, we don't know where we're headed. 
If we don't have a plan, we don't know how we're going to get to that place. So there's a lot of elements to that predictability that needs to be in place as well. And then, of course, there's consistency. The consistency in the mental approach, the consistency in the relationships, the consistency in how we present information and how we make decisions. Folks appreciate that. Right? These are, these are big ideas of creating a culture of safety. Do you see this one down at the bottom of the list? Norms? How many of you have norms established in your school or setting, your division, your department? How many of you realize that if you haven't established norms, you have norms for how you operate in your building, in your division, department? See, the thing about norms is if we don't take the time to intentionally craft and cultivate and define and describe them and communicate them and then expect them, that they will describe and define us for us. We can either create them or they can be created on their own. Uh, so we're going to have a little fun with norms for a second. We're going to have a little conversation about norms. And I'm going to ask you for one norm in particular. Because we could sit and describe the ideal setting and the ideal schools and it would be beautiful and fantastic, sunshine, rainbows, and unicorns, and we'd all say, yeah, I want to work there. And the reality is, no matter how explicitly we create our norms and no matter how uh, emphatically we all endorse those norms and everybody signs with their most beautiful handwriting on the, the norm piece of paper, somebody's going to violate a norm. It's just a matter of time. And the question becomes, how do we as a team respond in that moment? And if we haven't thought of it in advance, then we're reacting. If we have thought of it and we have a plan, then we're responding thoughtfully and intentionally and deliberately about it. So, what I'm going to ask you to think about, and if you have done this with your setting already, please feel free to bring whatever examples and whatever norms you have for this to your conversation at your tables. If you haven't thought of this before, I want you to think of pie in the sky, best case scenario, perfect world, because that's really the only place that I want to live. So what would it be like if we address behavior that's incongruous to our norms in a way that was thoughtful and intentional and deliberate and did all these things at the same time. Reinforced connection, made teachers feel supported, clarity of the procedures, respect people as human beings, there was order, folks trusted each other. How could we make sure that we did that while confronting or addressing behavior incongruous to our norms? Make sense? So I want us to brainstorm together. So you at your tables, you got some note cards at your tables, or you folks in the back, there's note cards by the water if you don't already have some. Uh, feel free to engage in some dialogue and somebody scribe, whether you want to use a note card or a tablet or whatever, somebody just kind of scribe some of your ideas for how this might look and sound if we were to address behavior incongruous to our norms and reinforce that culture of safety at the same time. All right? Okay, I'm going to come around and eavesdrop while you're talking and jot notes and then we'll share a few out in a few minutes. See what we come up with. So, what are some of your, some of your ideas about how to do this? How do you do that if you're working with adults in a, in a meeting session or in a hallway or in a faculty lounge or in the parking lot or wherever you might be? How do we confront behavior that's incongruous to our norms? What'd you come up with? Aha, so you will have a conversation directly with those people who violate the norms somehow when does that happen? Okay, so that emotional consistency that you intentionally bring to that equation allows you to not fly off the handle when somebody violates a norm and then, yeah, flip our lids. So you have an opportunity to take some time and it's either you see me after class and we'll talk about it or as you exit the meeting, right, you kind of happen to, oh, how coincidental that we're walking next to each other right now. So let's talk about what just happened, right? Or it's, I'm going to give you some time. I'm going to take some time. We'll connect tomorrow and have this conversation. OK. And what's your role? You're the principal. OK. You're the elementary principal. OK. Thank you. What else? What are others? So knocking on the table is a nice physical, it's, you can hear it. It's clear. It's obvious. Somebody's acknowledging, hey, something's going on that's not OK right now, which means we either need to check ourselves or we need to talk about it. So that's something that's been established. And sometimes people are willing, does this sound familiar? Sometimes people are willing to confront their colleagues on their behaviors, and sometimes they're not. Like sometimes there will be people who immediately will knock. Hang on. And there are other times that we go to knock and we're like, I don't want to get in that argument right now. So I'm not going to, I'm not knocking. Someone else can knock. No one's knocking? 
Really? Okay. Right? Have you seen that before? And then what happens? What have you just established? The norm that we said was important is not really that important, and we've established a new norm, which is it's perfectly fine to come in late, or it's perfectly fine to be on your cell phone while we're having a meeting, or it's perfectly fine to you fill in the blanks. You've seen all the behaviors before, right? If you don't define the norms and describe the norms and reinforce the norms, then they will define what we do. My pal Todd Whitaker, who you may know from uh, what great principals do differently, what great teachers do differently, he says the, the culture of a school is determined by the worst behavior the leader will tolerate. And make no mistake, norm reinforcement starts with leadership. It really does. I've, I've counseled, I can't tell you how many school staffs as they've built professional learning communities and they've built this culture of safety and they've built norms together in which the principal says, well, if I'm not in the room when this happens, because it's one thing if the principal's in the room and you see it and you're like, yeah, well, I can confront that. I can talk about that. Great. And everyone's looking to you to actually do that. What if I'm not in the room? What if I'm not there? The question becomes, what have we done to equip our people to knock on the table and to have that courageous conversation? Do they have the words? Do they have the skills? Do they have the willingness to have that conversation? Do they have the, the relationship and the trust and the connection to be able to have those conversations? Those aren't things that just magically appear. These are things that we have to cultivate and intentionally discuss and describe, which is why you just did that a little bit. I'm going to leave you with whatever you came up with, with some of your ideas. I'm going to give you a couple of different ideas that um, some staffs that I've worked with have have done. One of them is they actually gave each person a playing card and in any given moment, kind of like knocking on the table, if somebody violated a norm during a conversation or a meeting, anyone could hold up their card and throw it in the middle of the table. It was called their hurt card. You just hurt us because of what you said, because of how you behaved, or I feel hurt as a result of something that just happened. It was a tangible thing that, okay, hang on, time out, we need to have a conversation. I've worked with staffs that actually call time out Hold on, time out, we need to back up, make sure we're okay here. I've worked with a staff that went to a, um, leadership team of the staff went to a, a conference and there were 11 of them, so they called themselves Ocean's 11. And then their code word or their, their keyword, remember the meet the Fockers? It was muskrat, Jay, muskrat. So that was the word that means shut up, don't say anything else, right? So their code word, their safe word became ocean, which was mispronounced more than once in their meetings, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So at any given moment, we say something to capture our team's attention that says, hang on, there's something going on that's not OK. We need to discuss it. Because if we don't stop and discuss it, it becomes the new norm. And it's much more difficult to address it next time, because now we have a pattern of behavior that we've already established is OK. And now we have to re-come re back and say, no, that's really not OK. Does that make sense? The whole idea is, when's the best time to create norms? before you ever need them, right? When's the worst time to try to establish norms? Recovery, as soon as someone violates what we believe should be the norm, right? Like somebody's on their cell phone, we're like, all right, team, we should have a norm for cell phones. And then Mrs. Cell Phone over here knows exactly who this is all about. And she's like, hold on, I'm offended by that. Why are you going to pick on me? You guys have all been on your phones all year, right? And then it's an argument. And establishing norms shouldn't be an argument, it's an agreement. How are we going to act together? How are we going to treat each other? How are we going to do this? So I'm going to share with you one thing, and then I'm going to give you one more real challenge here in a minute. So this is from a uh, middle school, Shaw Middle School. There you go. These are the norms that they established. And so what you see are some guiding questions that are bold that all start with three words. How will we? How will we do this? How will we do that? Do you guys mind sharing back here? Thank you. How will we maintain open and honest community? How will we build trust? How will we, et cetera? And if you look at the fourth, how will we, how will we hold each other accountable to our expectations? The second one on the list says, we will confront behavior that is incongruous to our norms. Now, this staff actually then sat down and did exactly what you just did, which is to brainstorm, OK, how are we going to do this? And as a faculty, they came up with a single strategy. And then within each grade level, with each de department, they came up with their own because there's different dynamics in each smaller group, each smaller settings. How are we going to do it in this setting? Obviously, the more consistency there is from setting to setting, the easier it would be, say, if you're walking down the hallway and you hear a colleague say something disparaging about a kid or a parent, and you're like, hang on, that's not the way we do stuff here. 
it's kind of nice if we all have the same code word or the same approach to be able to say to that person, hey, time out. I couldn't help but overhear you. One of the things that we really want to do is talk positively about kids and families. How, how can we reframe that in a positive way? So I wanted to share that with you. So you have that as a, a reference point. I find that norm conversations are best started with the how will we questions. And we can decide as a staff, what are the how will we questions that we want to ask? What are the things that are most important to us? Um, here's a challenge that you run, come upon as you build norms. Um, you'll find that norms are, come from one of two places. One is pie in the sky, perfect world, best case scenario. How will it be if we, op if we are operating really well together? What will it look like, sound like? And we really kind of create that vision for awesome. The other is, what are some really crappy things we do right now that we need to stop? Right? That's kind of a dangerous place to be because it, it tends to be pointed at certain individuals or groups, pockets of people. So if we can avoid that language, and that usually surfaces like, well, we got to stop showing up late to meetings. Right? All the people who show up late to meetings know exactly who that's about. We gotta stop having our cell phones out. We gotta stop engaging in side conversations. We gotta stop bashing our kids in the parking lot, uh, verbally. <laughs> right, so instead of we gotta stop doing this, we want to build these norms and have these conversations around the ideal world. What would it be like if we were to do this really, really well? And really intentionally craft that. And we talked about vision, we talked about that consistency, and this is a way to do that. So I'm going to give you another challenge now. Uh, you had the opportunity to kind of brainstorm how will we confront behavior in Congress to our norms. So here's your challenge. You're in a team meeting. You're sitting having a conversation. And you're talking about a kid. You're talking about how you're going to provide support for a kid. And somebody presents an idea. And one of your teammates and in the meeting oh, does that. Oh. Like we could provide this kind of support for the kid and someone, oh. Now, that's subtle but significant behavior. So let's put into practice what you just discussed in brainstorms. I'm going to guess that being disrespectful to a colleague in a team meeting would violate a norm. So how might we address that? And I would encourage you at your tables to figure out, practice it, try it. How would you do what you just talked about possibly doing? How would you say it? How would you have that courageous conversation? What are the words that you might use? And the reason I'm going to ask you to do this for the next couple minutes is because it's, it's easy to say those words. I would have a courageous conversation with that person. It's much more difficult to figure out exactly what the words of a courageous conversation are and how they sound, especially if you're trying to maintain connection and support and relationship and trust, and you're having a courageous conversation about kind of totally inappropriate behavior as a grown-up. So I encourage you to try it. So with your table mates or with your teammates together, kind of just put it out there and say, hey, you be the eye roller and let me try some things. And you tell me how it feels when I say these words. And then turn the tables and try it the other way around and see how that goes. Let's confront that behavior. I'm going to eavesdrop. We role played and then we kind of got into more of a philosophical conversation about norms and I think that's great. I think that's wonderful because we need what we need, right? I do, but I'm not going to give one to you. I'm just kidding. I will, I will make sure that you get one. I know I just totally violated a norm. It's online too. Yes, this handout is on the... Um, I, we uploaded it to the site for the conference as well, so you can get it, you can get it there. And I have a, a paper copy special for you. I'll autograph it for you for whatever that's worth. Um, I'll sign anyone's name that you want, too. You, you just tell me the name. I'll do it. Keanu Reeves, done. Okay. Um, okay, so what are your thoughts as, as you come back from that experience, the degree to which you had that conversation and or just talked about norms, what are your thoughts right now about this, this idea of establishing clear norms? What's bopping through your heads right now? What are you thinking? What are you wondering? What are you noticing? Yeah. So there's a great big, it, it depends on that, right? And the, probably the most um, appropriate answer to that question, besides being it depends, is let's talk about that before it happens. So everybody knows. 
right? So, and as principal of the school, you may tell your staff, hey, if you violate a norm in my presence, I might call you on it in that moment, or I might wait and kind of amble up next to you in the hallway and have a conversation, or I might come visit you during your pet period and we'll talk about it, or I, I might sleep on it and we'll talk about it tomorrow morning, but you can bet that I'm going to follow up somehow. And the key in this to truly establish a culture of safety is to create this environment in which I don't have to be in the room for someone to call a colleague out for violating the norms. That this work is so important to all of us and the way that we interact with each other and the relationships and the trust and the connection is so important and so valuable to us that we won't allow each other to act in ways that sabotage our work and sabotage our relationships and sabotage the progress we're making for kids. We're just not gonna allow it. So somehow it's going to be addressed and lots of times we lean on the principle to do it first to show everyone else how it's done so I advocate for role playing in faculty meetings. Do this, ex this very example and your staff will laugh and joke and play and then there will be one or two people that will be like, I'm pretty sure that was me. Uh, this, this was written for me. And we have the conversation in advance and we practice it in advance and then they'll wait for the principal to do it first publicly and then the cap is off that jar, and then it's everybody's opportunity. It's free game to, okay, that's how we do it. That's how it works. I'm in. Yes, sir. Well, the reality is you already have norms established. And it would be really interesting, this is the conversation we had at this table, to ask your folks, well, what are the norms that we already have in place? That they're maybe not written down. They're maybe not on a form that says our norms. But there are norms for how we already operate. So pose to your staff, how do we handle it when someone shows up late to a meeting? What are some things that you have seen in this building or heard in this building when someone shows up late? And they'll go through their whole list of things for this is how we handle tardiness, adult tardiness, right? And then we handle, okay, so how do we handle when we have a conflict with each other? We have different ideas about how things are supposed to be done around here. What are some things that you know? And you'll hear all sorts of stuff. And then for each of the items that gets brainstormed, ask them, okay, which one leads to a positive resolution towards the perfect world where we're efficient, we're effective, we're getting results, and which ones don't really take us to that place very well? And you put a plus or a minus next to each item on the list. And you use that to have a conversation, and then you say, okay, well, wouldn't it be nice if we did things that actually led us towards our goals? Wouldn't it be nice if we did things that were in alignment with our mission and our vision? Wouldn't it be nice if we did things that were actually positive and productive and made us feel good about coming to work and interacting with each other every day? So let's take the ones that have pluses next to them and formalize our agreement that this is the way we're going to operate. That's an idea to put that out there. Um, it's also interesting just to surface, are there things that we ever do with each other in work that really derail us? What are those? And I'll bet your staff could list all sorts of stuff that we do that derail us. And if we don't have some kind of mechanism to call each other out and to halt that from happening, the assumption is all that behavior is okay and that we can continue to do that. And I don't think anyone in this room would say, yeah, this is the way we should be acting with each other. That's super professional. That's really productive, right? That's not what we're going to say. So we should have some kind of professional agreements to say, how are we going to operate with each other? How are we going to act together? So the interesting thing that you brought up is about uh, meeting norms. The eight people on the leadership team or whatever sit down and that's, that's meeting norms. And meeting norms are similar. What you see in front of you, and this very staff actually also had uh, meeting norms established, which were slightly different. This is operational norms. And you see the little subtext under there? What exactly does it say? Work together in all places and at all times for all purposes, professionally, professionally and respectfully. So this covers hallways, parking lots, uh, the gym at the game on Friday nights. It covers every opportunity we have to interact with each other so that we have the right and the expectation to call each other out and to have honest conversations about when we're not doing these things. So if, if you look up online, Edutopia has a great series of videos, and one of them is on norms. Did we watch that? Did some of you might have seen that yesterday? Kristen and I showed that yesterday. 
um, in one of the sessions. Um, there's a great video about how a, a middle school teacher in Maine starts his class by remembering the norms of how we operate. It's not the classroom rules. It's the norms of how we operate. So how are we going to work zealously? How are we going to work cooperatively? And how are we going to be committed to our own learning and betterment? And then that puts everybody in that frame of mind that that's what we're trying to do here. And then as they go through the work, if somebody's behaving in a way that is messing up other people's learnings, instead of saying, you're not following the rules, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, it's, hey, you're violating our norms. We said we would do this. How do we get you back to that level of commitment to your own learning? How do we get you back to that level of supporting each other in this environment? It's a totally different mindset to violating rules or violating norms versus um, breaking the rules. Absolutely. And we do it in our classrooms all the time. All right. So hang on to that conversation with norms. I can tell you, when we create this culture of safety for adults, having clear norms matches a lot of the things that we just talked about up there. I'm going to give you one other thing, uh, two other things. One is about vision. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on vision. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of vision. This is a protocol that you could leave, so lead. So that if you're thinking about, gosh, we don't really have a clear vision in our school or our department about where we're going or where we're headed, here's an idea. You could actually do this, or you could just propose this hypothetically. If you were to walk around and ask staff, and ask students, and ask parents, and ask community members and business partners these questions, would you get similar responses from them? Or would it vary from person to person, role to role? So if you asked them, what does success here look like? Do people have an idea of what the success criteria are that we're looking for? What if you ask the question, what are we truly trying to accomplish here? Would you get good response? What are our goals as a school? What would you get from that if you ask folks? And if you ask the question, what will this place look like in a year, five years, 10 years? Would people be able to give you consistent responses? If you get consistent responses and they're aligned with what you would say, then you probably established a pretty good vision for how things are going. If you get varying responses from people, then it's time to get everyone back together and say, okay, so let's build some vision. And here's the vision protocol. We're not gonna do this right now, but here would be the vision protocol. And this is actually uploaded on the handouts as well. It's called the DOT protocol. It's a, it's a way of gathering consensus. So we're putting vision with consensus building together. Kind of goes like this. And you can see my orientation towards the perfect world here. When our work goes spectacularly well, all right, and so this one in particular says we've established a robust trauma-invested culture of safety, but it could be when we have implemented uh, project-based learning really well, when we have created inclusive environments for all our kids. I mean, whatever it is that you want to build the vision around, you insert that there. How will we know? You see the questions. The, the idea here is we're truly building a picture of what it looks like when we've done this work really, really well. It's somewhere down the road, it's in the future, we create that. So what we do is we ask then, the, here's the protocol, we ask everyone to reflect individually on this. Okay, what would this look like? I'm gonna take some notes, I'm gonna write some things down. This would be happening, this is what it would look like. Then we ask folks to get together as a team. So each team, each department, each table would sit down and they would compile their individual reflections. Someone takes notes on a piece of paper like that and we just, we brainstorm them together. Then we have eight different sheets of brainstormed fantastic ideas about this vision of this amazing future, and we discuss everything that's on the lists so that there's no confusion. Remember, clarity precedes competence. There's no confusion about what's on that list, what are we talking about, what are we trying to describe, and if team one surfaces something that team five also had on their list, then team five crosses it off so that what's left on our eight poster charts are just the unique items. Then we follow what's called the dot protocol. Have you done the dot protocol before? Where everybody gets three sticky dots and they represent votes. And you can vote for three different things. The three things on those eight sheets of paper that I feel personally would have the greatest impact on us to attain that vision or the characteristics of that vision that are most appealing, most desirable. And if there's something on that list that I feel really strongly about, I might put all three of my votes there. And everyone gets three votes. And what we're left with is, a very visual representation of the will of the group. That you'll have items that have more votes than others. You'll have some items that were great ideas that have no votes at all. And you'll have some items that have a tremendous number of votes, and those are clearly the priorities. And then as the leader, you get to, to say, I'm going to take the top three, and we're going to focus on those, or we're going to take the top four or top five. You get to kind of massage that, because 
you can imagine what it would be like, right? You came up with all the votes and you're like, gosh, the one that I really wanted us to move forward is the fifth one on the list. So I can't just take the top three or top four. We have to go to five to make sure that gets included in all the conversations that move forward. That's just a creative leadership trick. But it's a way to make sure that the most important things that rise to the top, the will of the group, is surfaced. Um, and then you've got your de facto consensus. You got your, these are the five things that we're going to work towards. And then you build your plan around how do we create this vision and make it a reality. All right, there's more information in the handouts online on the conference website uh, under the handout that's called dot protocol for this session. So you can look that up um, about how that might look. And feel free, Joel, to take some pictures if you need to. All right. All right, so the last thing I want to do is this one. Because when we talk about creating a culture of safety, part of what we need to do is make sure that we're meeting our adults' needs. And each one of you came to this workshop today. You came to this conference. You came to this session for a particular reason. You had something that you needed, something that you wanted, some question you needed to have answered. What I'm going to do is ask you, what was that question? What was that need that drew you into this place right now? Because as professionals, you needed some professional learning. You wanted it on this. What was your question? What was your need? What's your desire? I'm going to give you four choices. It's a forced choice. So number one, did you want research on how to create a culture of safety? You wanted to know that statistically this is going to impact learning in some way. You want to know how it's been done in other places before. You need that piece. If that's you, then you're group one. Did you want to know kind of the big picture of why would it be important to create a culture of safety for adults? Why is it necessary that we do that? How does that fit in the bigger picture of us mastering standards and making sure kids' IEPs are being met and et cetera, et cetera, right? If it was the why question, then you're group number two. If your question was, gosh, I kind of want to create a culture of safety, but I'm not going to go into the session by myself. So as long as we go as a team and we'll sit and we'll have this conversation, that's great. I'm going to do that. We're going to learn it together so that we can have this conversation later and or I want to hear from Pete because I know he was a principal and he's going to tell us stories about things he's done in his school and I need to hear the, the actual practitioner side of things as opposed to the research. That's group number three. And if it's number four and you're saying, man, I just want strategies that I can implement when I get back to the building next week. You give me five things that I can go do. Give me a protocol. Give me some strategies. Give me a list of norms to establish. Just tell me what to do. I want to be able to do it better. I'm on board. I'm in. How do I do that? How do I do it better? That's group number four. And my hunch is, each of you can identify with maybe more than one of those. There's probably one that rises to the top. So what I'm going to ask you to do on the count of three is to hold up the number of fingers that matches the, the item that is most important concerning to you in this moment. All right, so one, two, three. If it's one, just be right, raise the right finger. All right, ready? <laughs> on the count of three. One, two, three. Show me. What do you got? Now look around the room and see what everybody has. I see twos, I see threes, I see fours, and a one. Welcome. OK, so we got everybody. Now, what's interesting about that is that distribution is going to be really no different than your staff, your team, your department. Anytime you lead a new initiative or provide new PD, you're going to have people with varying needs. And we need to be cautious and cognizant about addressing those needs. So let me give you a little bit of background on this. This will help with the research bit. If you're looking at performance over time in anything, in the implementation of a program, or if you're looking at uh, change or growth, which line do you prefer, the blue line or the red line? No, that's a real question. <laughs> OK, so I hear some red. Did anybody say blue? OK, so why red? It continues to increase. It's got a higher end point. OK. What about at this point in time? Which is preferable? Blue might be preferable, right? At some point, a transfer from blue having higher results to red having higher results. Interesting, isn't it, to look at that? So what, this, what the research would support on this is there's two different types of leadership. Blue is directive leadership, which is do it. I'm telling you to do it. Go do it. This is how you do it. I expect you to go do it. Good. I've made it very clear what I want from you. Now go. And then red is empowering leadership. What are the goals that we want? How can we build a plan to make that happen? How can we learn this together? Over the short term, directive leadership has a pretty profound 
increase and significant increase over the empowering leadership. In the long term, capacity building wins the day, doesn't it? So what ends, what ends up happening is directive leadership, go do this. At some point, you're going to get to a point where you have to make your own decision, and you're incapable of making your own decision now. You're going to come to the leader and say, what do I need to do? And you've already tapped out and maxed out my expertise and what I can help you with. So I don't know what to tell you anymore. Now you're on your own. That's why we kind of flatline blue at this point. Whereas if I build your capacity, it may take a little bit longer to get you there. But once you go, it's go time. So I'm going to share a little bit more with you about this big idea. Because as, leaderships, we, as, as leaders, we tend to have lots of really, really good ideas for what people should be doing. right? We know the research. We know what, what it should look like. We've, we have this clarity of vision. Now just go and act the vision. And folks don't do it for some reason. I can't figure out why don't, folks don't realize how great my ideas are. So we have to figure out why directive leadership produces diminishing returns. So imagine this. If I were your boss and I told you, teach this way, teach this lesson, and you don't do it, I've, I'll try some other strategies, like teach this or I will ding you on your eval. Do you think that would work? Do this or I will fire you. Do you think that might work? Do this or you will die. Do you think that will work? Well, there was research to support this notion that even fear of death is not enough to compel people to do other people's bidding for them. So this study came out where doctors gave their patients the most dire of, uh, what's it called? Prognosis, diagnosis, prognosis, yeah. If you don't stop with the, the sugary sweets, if you don't stop smoking, abusing alcohol, drugs, whatever, you're going to die in such and such amount of time. Now, even given this unbelievable information, guess how many people out of 12 on average, out of 10 on average, were able to maintain changes in lifestyle beyond 30 days? Like, stop the alcohol. How many of them were able to stop alcohol and continue with the alcohol abatement program after 30 days? Would you believe one out of 10? It was about 11%. So 90% of people knowing that if I continue to act in this way, I will die sooner, continue to act in the way. Why in the world is that? And then we think as supervisors, if we tell our people to do stuff, they do it, and we try to figure out, why won't you do it? OK, so there's more to it than that. I'm not going to share that one with you. I'm going to share this one with you. What we want to do is we want to help our people to understand, yeah, we've got a goal. There's places that we're going, whether it's the vision, whether it's the norms, et cetera. And we want to share with them also the reality of what it's actually going to be like to get there. So many times we skip right past that and we're like, oh, it's going to be sunshine and roses all the time. No, it's going to be sunshine and roses when we get there. It's going to be hell and misery till then, right? And we just have to be real on that, that piece. And together we'll make it through and we'll survive and we'll thrive in that environment if we are willing to work together. Okay, thank you. Here's another piece of that puzzle of what that looks like. And this is research that a lot of people I have found do not have. This research really came from the idea of school turnaround leadership. But it really also speaks to the idea of implementation of initiatives. At some point, we realize something's not working the way we want it to work. Problem recognition. And so we do something differently. We launch an initiative. We try something new. And then just by virtue of doing something new and different, we get a little bump in performance. And that we call low-hanging fruit. So you all remember when we had, um, let's really reinforce literacy. We're going to double block literacy, or we're going to have an intercession literacy program. We're going to have a summer school. We're going to have after school literacy. We're going to do lunchtime literacy, something like that. And we're going to get our bubble kids in the literacy groups. And all of a sudden, the bubble kids made just enough progress to show not proficient to proficient. And we're like, oh, we've done it, right? We got the low hanging fruit, and we got those bubble kids up. They passed. We're thinking, oh, man, this is great. This is exactly what we need to do. This lunchtime thing is the answer. Well, guess what? We've run out of bubbles. And then all of a sudden, we've plateaued. And what happens with our initiatives at that point? What did district leadership tend to do? Abandon ship, right? Obviously, this is the wrong initiative. This is not what we need to be doing. Let's get this out. Now, the strategy may not have been the right strategy for sustainability, but the effort, the initiative, still could be the right initiative. So we need to hold our course. And we get to a point where we're like, OK, I don't know what to do next. Then we get some kind of help from the outside, whether it's professional development. We do a book club. We have some professional development come in for us. We do some kind of action research together, whatever it ends up being. And we learn a little bit more. We get a little bump in our trajectory. And then we come upon something that we can't quite figure out. And what happens is organizations transform 
when we start to shift our mindset, not our practices, our mindset, what we believe about kids, what we believe about what we can do. That's where you see what's called adaptive change, and that's how organizations transform. Most people don't ever see this. We only see the, gosh, this sucks. Oh, this is good. Nope, it sucks. We're out. And then since it sucks, let's try something else. And we just stay right here with our school improvement efforts and all our change efforts, rather than seeing the whole picture of what it takes to get to that place. The reason I'm sharing this with you is because your folks, just like you did come into this session, have particular needs when it comes to their learning. And if we're addressing all their personal, professional needs in professional development sessions and or just on the daily basis, we're much more likely to have folks that are committed to the outcomes and committed to the ideas. So the four learning styles, the bless you, one, two, three, and four, are these. You've got folks that need research. You've got folks that are all about the why and are go from, lead from the heart. You've got folks that are collaborative and they collaborate together. You'll know this when you've got your teammates that say, hey, can you stop talking and let us work this out now? And then you've got teams that are, I just want to know how to do it. Just give me the orders. Just let me follow the orders. Here's typically what happens. We start by giving a couple minutes of research. There's research to support this. This is a research-based idea. Marzano said, yeah, this is good, so get ready. We're going to do this. And then we're never going to talk about research again. We tell them why. We care about kids. We love kids. It's about making sure that every kid has an equitable opportunity to attain their, their potential and get their education. So everyone in this room believes that, so it's all about. We never talk about why again. We will give you opportunity to collaborate on a limited basis. And from then on, it's all about how do we do it. We focus on the nuts and bolts of implementation. That's one fourth of our staff that's getting their needs met. We've got folks that still need to be reminded of the why. We need folks that still need to have access to the research. We have folks that still need that collaborative opportunity to process. So we talk about creating a culture of safety for folks. This extends to our professional learning and our implementation of new and our implementation of change that we must address not just at the beginning. How many of you have ever had the research given to you in August and then never have another conversation about it? Or had a big conversation about why this is important and how this fits in the school improvement plan, but then never talk about the why again. We go straight to number four from then on. The more we cycle back and continue to put this in the forefront of our minds and our teachers' minds, the more likely everybody's having their needs met throughout. And I just wanted to share that with you real quick so that you have that piece of the puzzle in addition to some of the other stuff we talked about, culture, safety, norms, et cetera. And I know we're pretty much out of time. Right? So here's what I'm offer. If you want to stick around and chat and talk about any of those or anything else, please feel free to do that. Otherwise, Alexa's got, do you have a closing? Yes, another free book. That's what I love about this conference. They do a great job of making sure that you get resources to go, to go with you. So thanks for hanging out and, and chatting and listening to some of that. I, hopefully there's enough to generate some curiosity in, in your minds. Uh, like I said, if you have questions for me, come and chat with me. Otherwise, enjoy your last session of the conference and uh, have a wonderful weekend. Go get them.